Good morning, church. The psalmist said in Psalm 121.1, I lift my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Since today is kind of the beginning of Thanksgiving week, we're going to take a break out of the Gospel of Mark. So would you please open your Bibles with me to Psalm 100 as we study that psalm for Thanksgiving. In his commentary, Marvin Tate said this, It's a striking fact that Psalm 100 is the only psalm called the psalm of thanksgiving. If you study the psalms, you know that many of the psalms talk about being thankful. But this is the one that was designated by the writer of being a psalm of thanksgiving. He said the setting is assumed that there is this company of worshipers in front of the gates of the temple of the sanctuary. And they're summoned in to enter the courts of the sanctuary with shouts and songs of praise. It was a Thanksgiving service with a Thanksgiving meal with a Thanksgiving sacrifice. The worshipers were to come together and give thanks to the Lord. You know what I have found in my Christian walk that I have to remind myself over and over again, it's important to remember that everything we have comes from the Lord. Every good and perfect gift we have comes from Jesus himself. And again, since Psalms 100 is designated as that psalm of thanksgiving, it makes sense that we study it today. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, how to give thanks to the Lord. How to give thanks to the Lord. If your Bibles are open, Psalm 100, let's begin with verse one. The psalmist said, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. On January 20th, 1961, JFK, John F. Kennedy, gave a very famous speech where he basically was telling Americans that the torch was being passed to a new generation. And during this speech, he said his most famous words ever spoken. He said this, And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, Rather, ask what you can do for your country. What JFK was communicating is that as Americans, we should be so grateful that we live in the best country in the land that rather than seeking things for self, we ought to be asking, what can I do in return for that thanksgiving? There in your notes. Here within five short verses of Psalm 100, the psalmist is communicating that the Lord is the exclusive source of blessing. So he is completely deserving of our thanksgiving and our praise. And notice that the psalmist first mentions a joyful shout. Now within our conservative body here, you know, if you hear people shout, we do once in a while, it kind of seems off-putting a little bit because we're too conservative. But I want you to notice something. The word Lord that's used right there in verse 1 is actually capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is actually Yahweh or Jehovah. So what he's saying is this is the self-existing triune God of the universe, the creator. And so again, some people misunderstand who or what is the source of our blessing. And it's Yahweh, it's Jehovah, it's almighty, self-existing God who created is the source of all blessings. The scholar Derek Kidner said this, The joyful noise is the equivalent in worship, catch this, to homage, shout, or fanfare to the king. It's fanfare to the king. It's like the king has come amongst his people. He's just walked in the room. The king has come in and everybody shouts because of who he is. As I was writing this sermon, I thought about how it must grieve the Lord that we will scream and shout for a guy carrying a piece of pig skin into the end zone. <laughs> we will even scream and shout at a concert for our favorite rock band or something else. But when it comes to raising a hallelujah or a shout to Almighty God, we can't do that because somebody might think we're Pentecostal. C.H. Spurgeon said the original word signifies a glad shout, such as loyal subjects, again, when a king appears. 
Our happy God should be worshipped by happy people. A cheerful spirit in keeping with his nature, his acts, and gratitude we have because of his mercies. You know, I've often said that God has such a great sense of humor, and, and some of us Christians don't believe that. We believe that God is staunch and he's, you know, just so stoic and that we should just be afraid and never laugh and never enjoy him. And that's not how he is at all. We should enjoy God forever. But in the Bible, if you study the Old Testament, many times we see shouting when there was a victory in war. And then many times again in the Psalms, they're shouting unto God. So there is an appropriate time to shout. But there's also times that people shouted in rebellion. I want you to think about in the Gospel of Luke 23, 20. It says, Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, crucify him, crucify him. So the point is not to be obnoxious with shouting. The point is to give God the praise and glory due his name. And I want you to notice something in verse one. Who does the psalmist instruct to praise the Lord? All you lands. Everybody. Everybody praise the Lord. It's similar to Psalms 150 verse six. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath this morning? Then praise the Lord because he's the giver of that breath. We're to give the Lord worship and praise, and glory because of who he is and all he has done. W.A. Van Gimmeren said this, If we exist as a thankful people, God will use that joy to draw others to him. There in your notes, if we are a complaining, doubtful, and discouraged people, we are not a thankful people, and we fail in the call to draw all the earth in giving thanks. You see, once filled with the Holy Spirit, it should be a natural overflow within a believer of Christ to worship. It should be natural. It should be something that we just, we yearn to do it. And then we yearn to have others follow us in that. A.W. Tozer said this, worship is to feel in your heart, express in some appropriate manner, admiring awe. An astonished wonder, an overpowering love in the presence of our Heavenly Father. When someone does something nice for you, think about this. Someone does something nice for me, the first thought that comes into my mind is, how can I return that? How can I show that I'm grateful? I have taught my kids as they were growing up, always say thank you. I don't care if it's just someone opened the door for you, someone gave you something, always Be thankful. Always show gratitude. No one owes you. I know contrary to popular belief, nobody owes you a thing. So be grateful. So when someone does something for me, I'm always thinking, you know, how can I return the favor? How can I show them my gratitude? Well, think about this on on the level of God. How can we show God that we're grateful for all that he has done? What's the best way to show him appreciation? Now, God doesn't need us. God has everything. He's self-existing. He he owns everything, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So he needs zero from us. Yet, out of a grateful heart, out of a response to his great love for us, how can we then bless him? The psalmist here tells us to serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. There in your notes... Serving the Lord is also an act of worship. We tell the Lord what he is worth to us by our acts of service for him. And again, he's self-existent. He's the owner of all things. He doesn't need me. But as a response, I want to praise his holy name. You can't help but return gratitude when you realize the cost of your sin and the cost of seeing it poured out on Jesus on the cross. It should just drive your heart to want to be thankful. If nothing else, if if nothing else, all you got was eternal life. That's all you got was eternal life. That's enough. Yet your heart's still beating. 
You're breathing. You're in a nice room. We have a nice building in which to praise the Lord together. We have so much to be thankful for. The psalmist in Psalms 116, 12 said, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of his people. And again, God created us for a love relationship. So that response is worship and love back to him. But notice the psalmist also said, serve him in gladness. Not begrudgingly. Peter talks about that, that we serve him willingly, not begrudgingly. Yeah, I'll do it because no one else is going to do it. Don't do it. God can create a donkey to do it. Adam Clark said this. It's your privilege and your duty to be happy in your religious worship. The religion of the true God is intended to remove human misery and make mankind happy. He whom the religion of Christ has not made happy does not understand it at all. And he has not made a proper use of it. And then notice this in verse 2. Come before his presence with singing. Many times throughout the Psalms we see singing. So we understand that. What we don't understand as a people group is that singing is not about what you want. Singing is to worship the Lord. You see, singing on a Sunday morning is not the very meaning of worship. Worship is a lifestyle of telling God what he's worth, your worth-ship. Singing is simply one mode of telling God that. There in your notes, singing is not the only way to worship the Lord, but it's certainly an important part of worshiping the Lord. And here's the argument that happens in every church, or at least every church that I've ever attended is, I don't like that song. I don't like that style. That's not, that doesn't fit me. And you have the older folks who want this, the younger folks that want this, and the in-between folks that want this. It's not about our desires. First of all, let me stop here for a second. There is no Christian music. Do you know that? Do you understand there's no Christian music? And you might go, wait a minute. We just had some Christian music. No, we didn't. We had some Christian lyrics. Music is music. It's all moral. Do the lyrics point you to Jesus Christ? If they do, that's all that matters. It's all about him. It's not about you. Some churchgoer said this, I don't like worship today. And Francis Chan said, well, that's okay that you don't like it. We weren't worshiping you. <laughs> worship is speaking about the great things that God has done. That's what it's about. Really, honestly, I like hymns probably better than anything else. I love modern worship. I do, don't get me wrong, but I like hymns better than anything else. But it's not about me. It's not about me at all. And I want to worship the name of the Lord. So if the song does it, let's worship the Lord. Why? Because number two there in your notes, the Lord is creator. Look at verse 3. The psalmist says, Know that the Lord, that's Yahweh, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Again, the psalmist is making it very clear. Yahweh is God and you are not. The omnipresent that's present everywhere all-knowing, all-powerful, immutable God who does not change. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He's sovereign. But praise Him. He's also faithful and merciful and gracious and kind. And, and by the way, notice what the psalmist said. He created you. You didn't create Him. Right. And, and that's important. A lot of us have that backwards in our mind. F.B. Meyer said the sense of God's proprietorship is the true basis of our consecration. We must realize his rights over us before we can freely give him all he's due. 
you must realize he's the owner. And when you realize that, then you can praise him for who he is. But notice what the psalmist said. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I love that. Remember what Jesus said in John 10, 11. He said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives life to his sheep. A former shepherd turned author, Philip Keller, said this. Jesus came to set men free from their own sins, from their own selves and from their fears. Those so liberated loved him with fierce loyalty. Those so liberated loved him with fierce loyalty. David was a shepherd as well, if you remember King David. And inspired by the Lord, he wrote the 23rd Psalm. And I love when you break down the 23rd Psalm. And if you don't have the book, Philip Keller wrote a book on the 23rd Psalm that is just so rich. Because again, he was a shepherd. And so from a shepherd's point of view, he broke down the 23rd Psalm. And I'm going to break it down a little bit, but his book is fantastic. You see, sheep are basically helpless animals. They are. They're just helpless and they can't survive long without a shepherd. And basically what the psalmist is saying is we cannot survive long without a shepherd either. And so David found comfort and security and the thought that God cared for him and cared for his sheep. So let's break down the 23rd Psalm. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There in your notes. Philip Keller said, but who is the Lord? What is his character? Does he have adequate credentials to be my shepherd, my manager, my owner? I shall not want. In other words, I'm not in need. There's nothing I need tells us that we can count on the chief shepherd to provide everything in life that we need. Now, a lot of us don't get our wants and we said God doesn't fulfill our needs. You're still breathing. God has fulfilled your needs. Philippians 4.19, the Apostle Paul said, And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But I shall not want also means something else. And here's the convicting part. We need to trust the Lord to provide and not desire more than what God has given us. Because he knows better. And my shepherd will give you everything you need. All right, verse 2. Psalm 23, 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. Something you got to know about sheep. Sheep are nervous animals. And they very rarely will lie down almost ever. They only lie down when conditions are just perfect. And notice what David says. Again, a shepherd, he knew. He said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep, like Christians, we have a hard time resting. A lot of us have a hard time resting in what the Lord has done. But as sheep, again, of the chief shepherd, our rest comes from knowing him and knowing that he's working all things together for good for those who love him. We know it. He's promised it. And then notice, he hasn't given us fear. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and a sound mind. So if you have fear, it's not coming from the Lord. It's either coming from your flesh or from the enemy. Then notice the still waters. Still waters represent peace, right? There's no turbulence. There's no waves. There's, there's none of that. The waters are still because God is with me. He leads me beside still waters. He takes care of me. All right, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. There in your notes. Restores my soul. Demonstrates the rescue of a lost person who will come to Jesus for salvation. Rescue. He leads me. 
The shepherd will guide you. And by the way, the shepherd will always guide you into righteousness. So if you think you're being guided into something that's not righteous, it didn't come from the Lord. He leads me into righteousness. And so the guiding and the leading of the shepherd not only comforts, not only restores, but he leads me into righteousness. Verse four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And again, King David, remembering the days back when he used his own rod and staff to, to beat the bear and to beat the lion and to protect the sheep. He's thinking about the Lord. And he says, you know, when you're going through this dark and fearful experience in the valleys of emotions, we all have emotions, right? We go through these lows and highs. Some of us go through real highs and real lows, but we all go through them. And, and David's saying, during all that time, during the darkness of this world, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God, you're with me. And you promise to never leave me. You promise to never forsake me. Paul said in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at those verses and tell me what thing in your life can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Go ahead. Tell me. You think, well, I can. Are you a created thing? Right. No height, nor depth, nor powers, nor principalities, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and again, the rod and the staff, the picture of that, that he would beat a bear and beat a lion that's coming after the sheep. But you know what the shepherd also did with that rod and staff? When the sheep got out of line, he'd correct the sheep. My favorite part of Christianity. <laughs> when God corrects me. All right, verse five. David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. There in your notes, David describes the Lord's provision and goodness he prepares for those who love him. What the Lord has waiting for us in heaven is amazing, but he wants us to have abundant life now. Now. And notice the shepherd refreshes the head of the sheep. Provision is so great. There's so much. David says it runs over. My cup runs over because it's so much. You got to know in the Old Testament, oil was used by the priest to anoint either an object or a person that was going to be used in service or in worship to the Lord. Get this picture. So the priest would go with the oil, and if it was something that was going to be used in worship or service, he'd anoint it. If a person was, he'd anoint it. You got the picture? Just as a priest would anoint the head of his people with oil in the Old Testament, now Jesus Christ gives us the Holy Spirit to anoint us as his own special people to worship and to serve him. And then finally, David speaks about the goodness of this life and the promise of eternity spent with the shepherd. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Mercy is used as steadfast love in other places in the Old Testament. And together with goodness, it's the steady kindness of the shepherd towards the sheep. In Psalms 23, it ends with, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a promise. Jesus himself said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God promised to take care of his kids 
And by the way, he's a promise keeper. He's not a promise breaker. And then he promises eternity in heaven with him. Incredible love. So, Roman numeral three, thankful for the Lord. Look at verse four. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. The church I went to when I was younger, you know, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. Come on, you know it. <laughs> but this shows us that God's people, it's a picture of God's people entering the gates and through the courts of his tabernacle, which is also a picture of what's going on in heaven. The book of Exodus, the Lord told Moses, go and build this tabernacle. And by the way, be precise with it, Moses. It represents heaven. So be precise on the gold covering this and this size and everything about it. You need to be precise. Why? Because this represents what's in heaven. Then we're told in the book of John that Jesus tabernacled or dwelt among us. There in your notes, just as the Lord's glory was revealed in the Old Testament tabernacle, so he revealed his glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the invitation. And what an invitation. You may have gotten invited to a dinner this afternoon at church, but how about this invitation? The God of heaven, the creator, self-existent God, Yahweh himself, has invited you to enter through the gates and into the courts of heaven to see him. You know, the walls and the gates there in Jerusalem, they were, they were meant for security. And if you weren't a citizen of Jerusalem, you weren't coming in. You could die. Jesus said in John 10, 7, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There in your notes. Entering into his gates and courts is an invitation into the very presence of God himself. And again, the psalmist tells us to enter into his presence with thanksgiving. And of course, there's only one way possible. Right. Jesus in John 14, 6 said, I am the way I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the father but by me. And so there's a special aspect of Thanksgiving here also. Do you know that there's a special worship service when God's people join together and corporately worship him? This is why the writer of Hebrews 10, 24 said, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the gathering together or assembling of ourselves together as the manner is of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. One way of showing God thanks is coming together corporately. I remember before Promise Keepers went sideways in 1997, we went to the Oakland Coliseum and there were 50,000 guys in Oakland. And they started singing some hymns. And if you ever want to be moved, I mean moved, hear some terrible voices of 50,000 men coming together, singing. And I thought, man, this has got to be a picture of what heaven's going to be like. 50,000 guys just how great, you know, I mean, my goodness. When we come together and worship God together, there's something special about that. There really is. Then notice the psalmist says, be thankful to him and bless his name. Bless his name. How do I bless God? Compelling Truth said this. What does it mean that we can bless God? If God is perfect, how can I bless him? To bless God simply means to praise and honor his name. The Hebrew word translated bless in the Old Testament actually means to kneel, indicating the idea of honoring the Lord there in your notes. We do not add anything to him when we bless him, yet we worship him as an appropriate response 
to his greatness and his love for us. All right, number four, finally. Some reasons to thank him. Look at verse five. Why should I thank him? For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. The first reason to thank the Lord is because he's good. He's good. James Boyce said the gods of the heathen were not good. They were selfish. You could never know when they might turn and harm you, but not so with our God. There in your notes. The God of the Bible is and has always been good. Number one question in ministry has always been, how could a good God allow blank to happen? Right. We've probably all heard that as Christians. That question is so short sighted because they don't realize that God has a plan in everything. Even when things don't seem good, God is good. We live in a fallen world. So when things don't go our own way, it's really easy to say, but God wasn't good in this situation. But God is still good. And sin does have its own way. But God is good. And, and you know, when you stop and think about this, you know, God even understands the loss of a loved one. Right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to be tortured, to be hung on a cross. The innocent lamb of God took the nails in his hands and the nail through his feet for me. So God is good. He's so good, he was willing to give up Jesus. There in your notes, God's ultimate goodness is shown within his plan to redeem us. Even during the worst news possible. You want to know what the worst news possible is? It's not who got elected. It's not what measures passed on the ballot. You want to know the worst news possible? Ephesians 2 says you were dead in your sins and trespasses. That's the worst news possible. You were dead, eternally dead, in your sins and trespasses. But God, who is rich in mercy, loved you and sent his son Jesus that you don't have to pay for that disobedience. God is good. There is no evil within him. He's good. There's nothing unpleasant or dark about him. Everything he originally created, if you read the Genesis account, and he created and it was good, and he created and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. God created everything good. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above. God can only create good. He cannot create evil. Evil is the absence of anything good. God's goodness should lead us to thankfulness. And, and then notice, his mercy is everlasting. How long is everlasting? His mercy is everlasting. And, and his truth endures forever. <laughs> These are everlasting reasons to thank him. There in your notes, C.H. Spurgeon said, so long as we are receivers of mercy, we must be givers of thanks. And you see, God's goodness is based upon his love and his truth, which will never end. God has so many attributes. Again, he's present everywhere. He's all powerful, all those things. But at the root of everything that God is, God is love, according to 1 John. God is love. And we live in this constantly changing world. I mean, all you got to do is watch any of the news media, any of it, which I don't recommend. Let me save your blood pressure. Stay away from that stuff. But just watch it. And we live in this ever-changing world. Nothing remains the same. But God does. The Lord Jesus Christ never changes. Thomas Horn said, how glorious will be that day when we behold the everlasting gates of heaven lifting up our heads and seeing the courts above into which the children of the resurrection are able to enter there with the angels and the archangels singing forevermore to our God. 
So let's be thankful for the blessings. I try to think of a list with so many things to be thankful of. And again, we could all say, but I don't have, but I don't have, and I don't have. And that's such a terrible, terrible place to go in your mind. As we sit here, the very next breath I have is dependent upon the God who loves me. My eternal salvation is based upon the God who loves me. The very fact that the heat and the air in this room work is all because of him. The very fact that you're sitting here and you can hear that you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ who loves you and took the cross for you is all because of his love. God is good. And there are so many things to be thankful for. And of course, salvation is the best. But if we concentrate on who God is and all that he's done, it's easy to thank him. So the conclusion, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. God is so good. You know, and again, if you just stop for a second and realize the very fact that you're not homesick, God's good. But there's so much to be thankful for. God is so good to us. And again, not the least of these is our eternal salvation. We were dead in our sins and trespasses and deserving hell. There's not a one of us who didn't deserve it. And yet Jesus said, no, 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 wait, put it on my account. I'll take the bill for that. Jesus loves us so much and we have so much to be thankful for. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. We're going to sing some praises to him. I'm going to pray. And if you need prayer this morning, there's some people in the back who would love to pray for you. And, you know, we'd love to hear some praise reports as well. But God is good. You need to remember this. God is good. And no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what's happening around you, God is good. That's number one. Number two, but no, number one, God is good. And that's it. God is good. Let's pray. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithklamath.com. Make sure, if you haven't already, to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.